You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. And thank you for joining us for another spooky yet educational edition of Two Guys and a Lot of Wine. I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And I'm here with a very good friend of mine, Rachel Short, whose husband Brian and her own the Sewing Loft Studios of Avon. That's right. And also our wine lovers have been to Sonoma and Napa and will be sharing some of your experiences with us in this uh, wine tasting today. So I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Thank you for coming, Rachel, and you're in for a treat. We have some scary wines and some regular wines. And Jim, what is the topic of our show tonight? Tonight's topic, if you can't guess from all the corks on the table, is wine closures. We're going to discuss a lot of different ways to seal up a wine bottle tonight. Which we've never done before. No, this is, <laughs> this is new territory for us. All new. We've usually always had either some corks incorporated with regular wine tastings. This is all new. Yep. Modern technology at its best and some scary themed wines, at least one of them. But we'll get to that. We're cramming show. a lot into this show tonight. We are. So we got to get through it <laughs> fast because we want to talk to Rachel about her business before the end of the show and also Sonoma and maybe nap if we get enough time. Super. So, Jim, I found this one, the uh, Pamiglia Cielo Prosecco. It is a twist-off Prosecco. And mm -hmm. I don't think in all our years of tasting, we've ever had a twist-off Prosecco. I've, it's the first time I've seen one. And it's a very interesting bottle. It's um, by a very old school Italian family in the Veneto region mm -hmm. of uh, Italy. And there it's a sustainable uh, vineyard. The bottles are actually 70% lighter, made with 30% well, it's glass than a standard bottle. So it's actually a lighter bottle. And uh, they use really economic, uh, eco-friendly um, growing techniques. And even the paper that they use for their label is uh, recycled. Now, I know that's a little political, and I don't mean to get political, but let's see if the political aspect of their winemaking translates to our taste buds enjoying it. So, <laughs> And that's a big trend in wine today, is to, to kind of have some kind of green stamp on your, your wine. And that's part of what we're going to get into tonight um, with these wine closures. Now, you think about a traditional cork, uh, this is carved from a, a, or taken off of a tree, so it's a natural product. It's biodegradable, uh, but the environmentalists have not been too happy with traditional corks because there's, there's been some scarcity. There's you know, so many wine manufacturers mm -hmm. using so much cork that uh, the cork kind of got, uh, became a little bit endangered for a while. Uh, so they moved on to this agglomerate, and this is little cork pieces that are stuck together with glue. Kind of like a pressed fiber board? Exactly. Oh, yeah. that's good. And the problem with this for wine connoisseurs is if you leave this in the bottle too long, the glue will kind of seep into the wine and start to change the flavor a little bit. Yeah, we can't have that. So, and it's also not biodegradable. Yep. Well, maybe you should finish your bottle of wine before that happens. But, you know what? <laughs> people aren't drinking fast enough. That's a good point. Now, I want so, to apologize, by the way, for not having actual flutes for this Prosecco. But there's only so much space. There's on the only table. so much space, and you know, I, this is also a lighter alcohol content Prosecco than some of the ones uh, we're familiar with. Um, in the past. There's only 10.5. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're ent entertaining during Halloween, you want to have a lot of people over. This would be a good way to start off on the lower side before moving into the heavier stuff where people are, you know, passed out. So hey, Mom <laughs> and I start with Prosecco all the time. That's true. Great way to kick off the evening. I love the bubbles, so I'm happy yeah. to start with the Prosecco. It's got a nice little lovely bouquet. Hmm. A little apple with that, too. Perfect for the fall. It's actually delicious. Crisp. Very crisp. Yep. Um, just a little bit drier. Uh, for Prosecco than I'm mm -hmm. used to. Certainly not overly sweet, which is good because we don't like that here. Mm, gentle fizz. And as you mentioned earlier, you know, this bottle is sealed with a screw cap. And that was, you know, the, go ahead, you can launch into this, but this, yeah. is, uh, this is kind of a departure from traditional corks. It is, and um, the uh, Cielo family is using it for a variety of reasons. First of all, they want their Prosecco especially to be drunk young. And a lot of screw caps are going to be used for wines that are relatively young whites, uh, a wine like a Prosecco, where it doesn't, they don't expect it to sit in the bottle a long time. It preserves the flavor better, and if you open the bottle and you don't finish it and you seal the bottle, it actually preserves the Prosecco or wine a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. So it certainly wouldn't use a screw top, at least the theory's not there yet, for a more bolder, like a redder wine, like a Cab 
or something like that. But a lighter reds and the lighter whites, screw tops are becoming more and more popular. And screw top has been around since the 50s, actually, but have always been associated with the bulk, inexpensive ones. Yeah. And um, Australia, New Zealand sort of changed that philosophy about 10 or 11 years ago when a lot of their whites were coming out and that's all they were using is screw top. And they were Sauvignon Blancs and uh, some really good, powerful whites. Mm -hmm. So the, there's, a, there's still a school out there both ways. Mm -hmm. But younger wines, there's really nothing wrong with using a screw top in regards to what. Uh, I agree. And you're going to see a lot of controversy with all these closures tonight. Uh, people are on both sides. You know, they're, they're for using it or against using it. Uh, the environmentalists actually get on both sides of some of these arguments. They do. It's kind of funny. They do. And, you know, it's one of those situations where I don't really drink wine based on any political stature of whether it's mm -hmm. environmental friendly or, you know, from the left coast or right coast. <laughs> I drink wine because I like the flavor. But I think um, the Cielo family has done a great job of taking a region of Italy, which was lo largely known for drink producing bulk wine, Italian bulk wine, which is tends to be cheap. And this isn't that expensive, but they've been uh, changing that philosophy around and changing people's attitudes, especially in Italy, about wines that come from the Veneto region of Italy. So this is about uh, 10 dollars to twelve ninety nine price point, which is certainly acceptable very for affordable. Prosecco. Very affordable and delicious. It's very nice. Delicious. And why is it you wouldn't want to age with a screw cap? <sighs> Most of the wine manufacturers that use screw tops uh, are lighter wines. Okay. So a lighter wine, you generally don't age. It won't. No, okay. Yeah, it's not going to develop any flavors as it. No, not okay. usually. Right? right. You can keep it downstairs for ten years. It's not going to really change anything. Got it. It won't go bad. It's just you're not gaining anything by storing it. Mm -hmm. So you might as well drink it. You might as well drink it. <laughs> yeah, most of the wine we consume here in the United States is meant to be consumed within two or three years. Okay. It's, it's a very small percentage that's meant to be put away. So it's more the foreign wines that you want to age for five to ten? Or? Typically, yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, the Bordeaux is a classic example, but the, those are wines that are meant to be put down and, and not be consumed immediately. It's, it needs five or ten years in the cellar. Okay. So we'll jump right into our second one, and you might be familiar, I know you're familiar with California wines. This actually is a haunted ghost white. It is a California blend. Um, I forget what region of California it's from. I think they use a, it's, it's a place that uses a lot of different vineyards to produce this wine. Okay. And this top is? This is a Stelvin. Hmm. So when you look at this, this screw top, uh, it's, it looks similar to the last one, but it's got a longer skirt. Yes. Uh, that's meant to replicate the foil that you find on a traditional wine bottle. Hmm. Now, you. this even though is a theme bottle of wine, but from the reviews I looked on, I haven't had this one yet, so this, I'm mm -hmm. going to this fresh. This is not a gimmicky white. This is actually pretty popular in certain areas of the country. It's hard to find here, um, but it's pretty highly re uh, rated. It's very light, it's very flavorful, and it's certainly good for large parties, especially those Halloween parties where you don't want to overwhelm people's taste buds because mm -hmm. they're eating so much you know, candy. So, I get lemon. Yeah, I do too. There's a lot of fruit with this, and it's mm -hmm. all right up front too. Oh, I was not expecting that. Yeah. This is a little syrupy. Slightly, but it's, it's not overly sweet. And it's, you know, it's following the trend of uh, a lot of the red blends that you get today, too. That, you know, it's, it's so much fruit and, and concentrated sugars. Um, it it's, it we, has a creamy aroma, if I can creamy, say that. That's yeah. Yeah. Creamy, that's Absolutely. Aroma. All right, does that taste like anything you're familiar with? When you were I haven't tasted it tastings? yet. Here goes. Oh, well, it's surprisingly light, despite the creamy mm -hmm. aroma, but it, it is a slightly sweet. Maybe a little bit of honey? Honey, I would definitely say that. Mm -hmm. honey. It's nice. I could see where maybe a few glasses would start to get a little heavy, depending on what your limit is. But You know, that's the thing. This is not exactly what I, the reviews did not live up to my expectations here. This is a little too creamier than I was expecting for too a Too sweet for you? I was expecting something like on the Pinot Grigio line, okay. but just a little bit more flavor for it's, California. It's got a little more body than a Pinot Grigio. Yeah. It does. It does. It's a heavier wine. Um, once again, this was highly rated in a lot of the sites that I looked it up yeah. on. Um, it's actually one of the more popular, inexpensive white blends mm -hmm. that this, this wine is made from. But I, I don't know if I'm going to give it a thumbs up yet. I have to take one more sip. <laughs> Can you put the cap back on? Mm. I, uh, there's a tip I want to share with you, the black one. Uh, and I just heard about this last week. I was kind of surprised. Normally, when you store wine, you know, you'll store the bottle laying down. Uh, and that's to keep the cork wet and to keep oxygen from getting into the bottle. But with the screw top, you want to you store it standing upright. Uh, there's a little bit of air in between the wine and the, the screw top. And so, you know, before you open it, um, you just leave it standing up and keep that air bubble at the top. You know, if you, if you put it on its side, you can see the air bubble kind of comes down to the bottom. Uh, and what I've heard is you want to have a, as small a surface as possible 
with the screw tops. And, and not that you're going to keep a screw top in the cellar for a long period of time, uh, but it's, it's the proper way to store something, any kind of wine with a screw top, is to have it standing up. Well, it, what's good to know is just, I know, Rachel, you and Brian are trying to build a little wine cellar yourself. We're trying, but we tend to drink everything. Well, we I know. <laughs> but you have a better option with a screw top because you don't have to, it doesn't take up as much room. You could stand it up. Oh, that's yeah. a good point. Which means yep. you can shove it off in a dark corner somewhere where the temperature stays the same. You don't have to worry about lying it down. You could mm -hmm. even stack it, I suppose. Yeah. If you had boxes, if you have got then boxes. you didn't have to worry about the tilt. Yep. Well, I'm going to give thumbs up to the Prosecco. I think the uh, Cielo Prosecco is delicious. I loved it. And I, I don't care for the Haunted Ghostly White. So. I'm going to give a thumbs up to the Prosecco as well. And I'm going to give the Haunted a half thumb. Half thumb. I found it interesting. Uh, I think it'll be fun for the Halloween season. Um, it's a good cold it's, white. Yeah. A little chill in the air. I can yeah. see that. I'm not going to drink a lot of it, but I'll drink a little. And Rach? I get to give a rating? Sure. Okay, well, I'm going to say definite thumbs up to the Prosecco. Oh, Bobby P's by himself. <laughs> Okay. Love the Prosecco. Um, I am with you. Thumbs down on the on the Haunted. Oh, good. Okay. I think I love the label and I like the idea. I liked the aroma, but it was a little too sweet for me. Mm -hmm. Okay, I concur. All right. So if you're a fan of sweet wines, the Haunted uh, might be. It's just not the overly thing for sweet. You. It's not just overly. at that borderline where it's just like I don't know if I could have more than one glass of that. It mm -hmm. might be a little too much if you prefer more of a savory. Yes. Yep. Now the fun starts. All here. right. Yes. Hooray. Next up, we have a wine closure called a Zork. Now this is, it's kind of a takeoff, a spin on a, a cork, uh, and it's real simple. This is an Australian invention. It's designed really for people who forgot their corkscrew. <laughs> now really, it's, it's designed to keep the environmentalists happy by not using so much cork. Although you're creating plastic, which fills landfills and doesn't biodegrade, and so that's going to upset the environmentalists. But anyway, the, the tagline for this is, peel it, and it peels right off, and then pop it. Oh, how cool. And it's a real simple plastic cork, no corkscrew required, and then pour it. Beautiful. It's a great concept. Great concept, and the Least Fitch Cab is a cab I drink all the time. This is one of my favorites. I'm surprised we haven't had it on the show before. I've been saving it. <laughs> I've been saving it just for this show, as a matter of fact. I'm honored to be here then, yes. on a special evening. Well, thank you for joining us on this special evening. <laughs> it's got a nice little... Uh, Oh. Nice nose. Nice nose, yeah. very much so. Light. Mm. Grapey. That's nice. You get a lot of fruit with this, a little vanilla finish. You do. It's both light and heavy at the same time. Mm -hmm. It starts off light and it opens yeah. up in your mouth. Great That's mouth really, feel. Really oh. interesting. It really opens up when you swirl. I get a lot of almost a floral aroma, some perfume in there. Is this French, California? This is California. And you know, this just goes to show you how inventive the Australians have been. Oh, they, they came up with the screw top, too. Yeah, you're right. So, you know, you got them inventing the Zork and the screw top. They, they've been at the forefront of different ways to close up a bottle of wine. That's a very interesting uh, you, you, that you notice that, because you're right, yeah. both the screw top and the, uh, and the Zork. And you wonder, I guess, if they have a lot of time out there. And, uh, they must. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> well, good. the Zork's going to be the new thing, just because people are going to want to say Zork when Zork they're drinking wine. Cool. Yeah. That, that'll be the new... <laughs> It does sound like a character maybe from Spaceballs, but... Uh, <laughs> or The Simpsons. Or The Simpsons, but... Uh, That's delightful. Thank you. Yeah, there, there's, this is really nice. And mm. uh, uh, what's the price point on this? Uh, this is 10 to $15, so it's very affordable. It's, a, it's an everyday wine for me. I, I drink this all the time. It's good. It's not heavy, but not yep. light. Yep, in between. Yep. Definitely would pair well. Um, with some cheese and absolutely uh, which we have on the table yep. but you guys don't get to see us eat this <laughs> it would, it'd be ugly so we'll wait till later to eat that but yeah this truly is the american style of red because it's it's wine that you can drink by itself uh, it doesn't have to have food but it works well with a lot of different foods it would absolutely and it's not too dry no kind of toes the line yep. there yeah not a lot of tannins with this does this compare at all really quick before we go to the next wine about what some of your reds were when you tasted when you were in california well we had a very interesting experience with reds and whites in california um we experienced both the good and the bad. And what you should. Yeah, it was interesting. Almost everywhere we went in Sonoma, um, we tried to focus on the smaller wineries, which were lovely, family owned, and everybody gets excited to tell you about their wines. They make you drink more than you anticipated. Mm -hmm. We, uh, Our first wine stop, they gave us 12 tastings because we were interested in their wine, and we stumbled out of there and had to have someone <laughs> drop us. But those wines you, were delicious. Remember what vineyard for, that was? That was Roche. That was the first stop on our yeah. first trip to Sonoma. You forgot the spit. 
We never spit. We never <laughs> spit, Jim. <laughs> but in keeping with that, we did go to one winery that I will not name because um, the people there were wonderful, so friendly. My husband and I had just gotten engaged. And so they said, oh, the tasting's on us. Have some more. Have all you want. I... I literally could not keep a poker face. It was the worst wine mm. I have ever had in my life. My husband, and as I said, we don't spit our wines. He he spit it out and said, how much more of this am I going to have to drink? Yeah. Please, no more tastings. <laughs> yeah, we've been there. We've all been there. <laughs> right? But it was such a lovely place, and it was one of our favorite stops. So we went again a couple of years later just to see if, in fact, it really was as bad as we thought it was. And, in fact, it was. Mm. But the people were still wonderful. So you know, it's interesting because you know a vineyard like that has to make a living, so people are sure. still consuming their wine. Yep. So it's just another example of people's tastes being a little different because yep. who they're selling their wine to that people yep. enjoy. And that's what I've been saying on the show since we've started is that there is a market for every wine there out is. there, it's and it somebody's good. buying it. Yep. Sure, somebody obviously likes that wine. I mean, we didn't care for it, but that doesn't mean maybe that it's not good. Yep. It just means it wasn't for us. Yep. So tell us about your studio. Our studio, well, my husband and I own and operate the Sewing Loft of Avon. We make custom soft furnishings, which is really a fancy term for uh, custom draperies, custom window treatments, pillows, bedding, table linens, slip covers, cushions, indoor and outdoor, pretty much anything that can be made from fabric we make, and we I, make it ourselves. It's funny you mention that. I just bought custom-made pillows for my wife for our second anniversary. And I we, noticed that you did not purchase them from the Sewing Loft of I, Avon. I did not know. <laughs> I should, have, I should have purchased local, yes. You well, have now to support for your years local. 3 through 30, you'll be coming to us for various anniversary gifts. Well, that was, cotton was the second anniversary. I believe silk is coming up silk, in the near future. Silk, gold, and silver. We can interweave. We can find some silks with okay. silver and gold woven right. in. So I'm sure I've, we can I'll help you out. I'll be coming back to you for at least three <laughs> anniversaries. Then. I expect to see you drop some big coin on us. <laughs> That's phenomenal. That's phenomenal. <laughs> Jim, two years. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. Congratulations, Thank indeed. You very much. That's wonderful. When you hit 10, though, let me know, because that's all right. where I am. All right. <laughs> 10? Yeah. That's yeah. a big one. It is a big one. It is. Thank you. Congratulations. Yes. A lot of wine and love in the last <laughs> 10 years. In equal parts? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Let's get to that cab. I've been waiting right. for that cab. This is another cab. Now, the, the closure for this looks like a cork. This is a synthetic cork. It's actually called a Noma cork, and it's developed from sugar cane. So it was designed to do a couple of different things. It was designed to be uh, environmentally friendly. So this is a zero carbon um, cork, and it's, it's not entirely biodegradable, but it is recyclable. Um, so that, you know, the company's pretty proud of, about the fact that you know, they're not harming the environment uh, as much as you would with, you know, with the agglomerate cork. Um, They've made this in a couple of different specifications, though, and this got kind of interesting. You can, the winemakers today are starting to talk about how much oxygen they want to have coming into the bottle while you're storing sure. it. And I always used to think that, and winemakers for centuries have thought that, if you're using a traditional cork, you don't want any oxygen getting into the wine at all. In fact, uh, that's what causes wine to go bad, is there's too much oxygen getting in, and it turns to vinegar, or you get that, you get that kind of... Um, moldy smell. And I've read reports, it varies between 6% and 15% of all natural corks fail. Is it that high? Yes, oh. it, it can be. Depending on who you're reading, it can be up to 15%. Uh, which Why is, is it that they fail? Do they, dis do they disintegrate? It's because or? it's a natural product. You know, there, there might be a, uh, you know, a little okay. uh, or hole or a, yeah, some kind of gotcha. opening that allows air to get in. And it could be very small but the air gets in, ruins the wine. Um, and I've told people on our show in the past, if you buy a bottle and you're, you open it up and it's bad, take it back to your retailer. Uh, they will either refund you your money or replace it with a comparable bottle. Uh, don't think that you know, they're taking a loss on that because they're just gonna return it to the distributor. And that's true. A lot of people don't ever wanna return a bottle if you buy something that's bad, please return it. If it's yeah. bad, bring it back. Yeah. Um, don't think that it's your fault. Most wine stores are very acceptable to bring back something that's, and they wanna know. Exactly, yeah, they do. And if you're at a restaurant, um, the waiter is supposed to hand you the cork before he pours the wine, and you should smell it. If you smell something odd, if it smells tainted, uh, you can send the bottle back. That's why you smell That's the cork. why you smell the cork. I just did it because I looked cool. Yep. Yeah. No, it's, it's uh, to keep you from drinking bad wine. Okay. It now is. I know. It is. Uh, but anyway, to get back to the Noma cork, this was designed to let uh, no oxygen in, or a little bit of oxygen in, or a little bit more oxygen in, based on the winemaker's preference. And winemakers are now starting to debate 
how much oxygen they want to come into the bottle during the storage process. Uh, th and that will greatly affect how the wine tastes. Uh, that, that's both for white and red, correct? Uh, well, more for red, <laughs> mostly for red. But there have been some wine tasters who've gone out and tasted uh, the same bottle that was sealed with three different kind of Noma corks, uh, one that let no oxygen in, and one that let just a little oxygen in, and one that let a little more oxygen in. And the, the taste was phenomenally different between the three bottles. So what the winemaker now has to do is to say, okay, how do I want this wine to taste after a couple of years? And then design the cork specifically okay. to allow whatever amount of oxygen in. So the fascinating side it topic. It is fascinating. That's fascinating. And my glass is empty. All right, <laughs> I will pour you the Avalon CAB. I just found this one a couple of weeks ago. It's a really nice color. Definitely bolder than the last one. Yeah. It looks like it'll have current, but you never know. Warm. That's more in line with what I enjoy for a cab. Okay. That's, uh, that's really nice. This was an instant favorite for me. And it's very affordable. It's, it's uh, under $10 in some locations. Really? Yeah. I would not get that. That's, yeah. There's a sophistication to that red, which is kind of surprising yeah. to me. Um, there's a little bit of heat and a smidge yeah. of pepper. Which is important because that's what you sort of want a little bit of heat in mm -hmm. October. You know, it's Halloween. It's a little nippy outside. Yep. You definitely get a little bit of heat. It hits you right in the back of the throat. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, it's I like a nice that. little surprise after you've it had is. your sip. I love that. Yeah, this is really good, Jim. And then, well, how did you find this That's one? nice. I was at a, a wine lecture, and this was one of the featured wines. A wine I fell lecture? In love with, uh, yeah. What did they yeah. lecture about? They, they, it was all wine. <laughs> now, see, we, Jim up we, in we Boston, said, he goes up to these... Fancy wine lectures. Is that, I'm assuming that's what this was up in Boston. Yeah. Maybe you should take yeah. the show on the road. We're going to have to. <laughs> yeah. At some point, we're going to get the cameras and go. Go to go a wine mobile. lecture in Boston. Uh, and this is another California? Yeah. Wow. It, it, it's nice. Both distinctly different cabs, which is why, like I said, we've been doing this show for so long. The flavor profile is so distinctly different between both of them, but yet each one is so beautiful in their own right. Mm -hmm. um, I like this one a little bit better, only because it... It's got that kick that I yeah. sort of like for a cab. I like this one a lot. And we drank those in the right order, too. We had the softer one first and then the heavier one second. Like you know what you're doing. That, we've been practicing <laughs> a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the, the last bottle I have here, we're not going to open. Um, Bob and I drink the, the Il Prosecco all the time. We do. It's mm. a fabulous Prosecco. Very affordable, too. It's in the uh, 13 to $17 range. But I brought this on just to show you the cap. Uh, this is what's called a crown cap. And it's, it's very similar to the bottle caps you see on soda bottles. Uh, and you just pop it off just like you would any kind of soda bottle. This is used, um, and here you see it in the final product that hits the shelves, but uh, champagne makers will use a crown cap if they're using the method champagnoise, which is where you do the second fermentation in the bottle. Mm -hmm. They'll put a crown cap on the bottle uh, after the first fermentation and then let that sit for a year. And then they pop that off do the dosage, which is when they add the yeast, and the second fermentation takes place inside the bottle. And then they add the cork and the, uh, uh, the cage that goes over that. Well, champagne is an entirely different process, as you would expect, it, but that's really interesting. Yeah, Prosecco uh, has the, champ the, they don't use the method champagnoise, okay. uh, but they do do a second fermentation, and it takes place inside a steel vat. And then they put the final product in the bottle. Okay. Whereas, Whereas the champagne does the fermentation in the bottle. The f the champagne undergoes a, f a first sh uh, the first fermentation in the vat. Okay. And the second fermentation goes to takes place in the in bottle. bottle. Oh. I'm actually kind of curious. I mean, you would think now this is just me that opening a bottle with some pressure in it with just a uh, that type of opening might be a little bit dangerous if there's a lot of pressure in there. But I'm assuming that's already been scientifically. Demonstrate where you're not going to have the top go flying off. We've done, we've, we've popped so many of those. <laughs> Never had a problem. I'm sure there were a few flying caps. Don't, just don't shake it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, uh, you're right. We have it a lot of those and I've never seen a problem. But uh, just, I'm, I'm thinking about it now only in the sense that, you know, is you do open it up like an old style mm -hmm. soda pop yeah. bottle. That's not a twist off. No. Yeah, so mm -hmm. if you, there's a little pressure in there and you go to open it up and, you know. I, at some point, maybe we'll shake that up and try and open it. <laughs> not on the show tonight. <laughs> So I gotta say, um, generally in the past for our Halloween shows, and I don't want, I don't want to really call this a Halloween show because it's really not, we've done a lot of gimmicky wines. And tonight, the only gimmicky wine technically is the Haunted mm -hmm. Ghostly White. All the other wines on the table tonight, even though this is gonna be aired during the Halloween season, 
these are all high quality, really good tasting yep. wines. I agree. So I, I'm really kind of surprised after all the years you've been doing the show to have this quality of wine on the table compared to some of the other. I, you know, I was trying had. to fit a vampire Merlot into the lineup tonight. <laughs> yeah. it, it just, we didn't have enough time, didn't have enough room. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get with that. That doesn't always mean it's going to be bad just because it has a gimmicky title. Because yeah. a lot yeah. of regular vineyards make these wines. Well, like yeah. Seven Deadly Zins, that's a cool yeah. name. Yeah. You know, Zen of Zins, and all, some of them, some, a lot of the Zens have those funky names, but they're still good. Or they're fun for the, yeah. just the holiday. Yeah, you know, it's, right. it's a wine you're going to buy once a year. You're not going to buy it any other time. But it, it kind of ties into what you're doing for that evening. And, Jen, we don't need any wines to highlight our bad behavior because... <laughs> we can do that all on our own. We can do that all on our own. So I, if I have to say really quick what my favorite wine tonight has been so far is, Jim, your Avalon. The Avalon yeah. CAB. Yeah. Yeah. Our remaining two minutes, I think that's my favorite. I'm going to go with the least Fitch. Hmm. Rach? I am going to second your vote, and I liked the last cab as well. Right. I thought that was really nice. It's this one was it towed the line between light and heavy. This mm. one's a little bit, a little bit softer and bold, a little bit bolder, but still yeah. kind of soft. Had a nice flavor to it. I really, I really liked that one too. Uh, number two, will I would say would be the Fitch, I believe. Okay. For the red, and uh, three, I have to go with the Prosecco, of course. Even though the whites are distinctly, obviously different than the reds, but the Prosecco third and of course fourth for me would be the haunted <laughs> i'm going to do the same thing i well obviously i'm going to switch up the reds but um the prosecco would be third for me and haunted's going to be on the bottom of the list well i'm going to go out of turn and say i love bubbles as bob knows so yes. i really enjoyed the prosecco that'll be my second choice awesome. okay. and then uh, not that any of them were any much larger, better, or yeah. worse than the other, but I really like the Prosecco, too. And we, did we discuss the price point in the Avalon at the end? Yeah, that was under $10. Oh, that's right. That's, that's, a, that's really yeah. astounding. If you gave me that as a blind tasting, I would just assume that was in the $20 range. Yeah. That's uh, how it's, it's such nice a and powerful that is. Such a bargain. So, I mean, you know, Goodbye. as we wrap up the show, and I know the show is going to be airing in October, um, I hope everybody has a great Halloween, by the way, you know, and uh, enjoy your wine and candy responsibly. <laughs> <laughs> It and doesn't just, matter what order, really. <laughs> right. And, and uh, I just want to remind you, please friend us on Facebook. Uh, we can always use more friends. Uh, you can like the show or share the show. Um, you can send us a message if you have a question or comment for us. Uh, please, please send us that. a message through Facebook. We've answered quite a few of those, and we get them from around the world. So I'm, we I'm do, surprised. actually. You're you know, worldwide. People I know. Japan, I couldn't believe it either. Australia. That's amazing. I, I was shocked. I was shocked. And don't forget, you can watch previous episodes of this show on whctv.org or on youtube.com. And uh, also, Rachel, I want to thank you again for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I hope I didn't interrupt too much. You didn't. Oh, please, you uh, okay. please you, come back. It was a delight. Thank you. You guys you. do great work over at the Sewing Loft. We try the, very hard to maintain a pristine custom product. So. And Brian, I know you're watching over in the studio. Cheers, Cheers to you. Cheers, honey. For having such a lovely wife to uh, be our guest. And as always... I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And keep both of us in, in your, your wine, wine cellar. cellar.